Well, welcome to the December meeting of the Vantage Seminar. And uh, we're very happy to continue with the series of complex multiplication on abelian varieties and uh, uh, reductions of, of curves in abelian varieties. And our speaker today is Jacob Zimmerman, who will be speaking about unlikely intersections and the Andre Ort conjecture. And Jacob, is it all right if we video this talk? Sure. Oh, great. And Jacob said it's fine with him if you want to ask questions at any time. So feel free to do that. And please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And yeah, please do ask questions at any time. Uh, that always makes everything go better. Um, yeah, so I'd like to talk about um, the Andre Ord conjecture, which was uh, which recently uh, has been solved uh, in full. And um, what I want to indicate is sort of a bunch of the mathematics that goes into it, because one really nice thing about this conjecture is it brought together a whole bunch of different fields um, that have now branched off into their own little stories. So I want to begin by explaining um, where the conjecture comes from. And it comes from a very concrete uh, setup, which doesn't require much background, which is always nice. Essentially, uh, it comes from a conjecture of Lang about uh, polynomial equations and looking for solutions to those polynomial equations in roots of unity. So basically, if you write down an algebraic equation um, in, let's say, two variables, x and y, um, or if you prefer, you can allow Laurent polynomials, you can invert x and y, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, then you can ask, does this equation have solutions and roots of unity? And uh, of course, it's too much to hope for that the answer is no there, because if I just give you some roots of unity, you can set up an equation with those roots of unity as a solution. And so Lang had the very um, good thought to ask, well, when can we write such an equation down, which will have infinitely many solutions in X and Y, such that they're both roots of unity? Um, and this is a very typical kind of construction in unlikely intersections. You sort of ask what you expect to happen. And in principle, you expect a random equation to not have a random point as a solution to it. You can, of course, engineer that unlikely thing to happen finitely many times. So if I give you finitely many pairs of roots of unity, I can write down through interpolation an algebraic equation that satisfies by those finitely many pairs of points. But for that to happen infinitely many times, that's kind of unlikely. That should have a reason behind it. And so formally, Lang made his conjecture um, in the language of algebraic geometry, because it's much more convenient. So uh, essentially what this becomes is you ask for curves, uh, curve C inside the two-dimensional torus, C star squared. And you ask, well, suppose this curve has infinitely many points on it, zeta, eta here in this theorem, such that zeta and eta are both roots of unity. Then what has to happen? And the solution is that there has to be some structure to this curve that um, is multiplicative because roots of unity are defined through a multiplicative relation. There are just numbers whose sum power of which is one. And so if your curve is of this form, where x and y, the two coordinates, are related through a multiplicative identity, then as soon as x is the root of unity, so is y. And so it's easy to see that you can get infinitely many solutions for these kind of equations. And the theorem of Lang, um, at least in the case of n equals 2, we're looking inside c star squared, is that this is all that can happen. You have to be a little bit careful. You have to allow m and n to be arbitrary integers here is why it's more convenient to allow Laurent polynomials, but this is the only thing that can occur. <clears throat> so if we branch out and think about this a little bit uh, geometrically, instead of just writing down an explicit equation, what kind of structure is this? Well, if x to the m, y to the n were to equal one, if we looked at that equation, then that would define an algebraic subgroup. It would define um, a, uh, an algebraic variety such that if you take two pairs of points on it and multiply them, just coordinate-wise, you get another one. 
if the zeta here is uh, an arbitrary root of unity, then this is not an algebraic subgroup, but thinking of this whole thing as taking place inside the algebraic group C star squared, it's a coset of an algebraic subgroup by a torsion point. The torsion point, for example, zeta to the one over m comma one. And so um, we make this definition of a torsion coset, which is the coset of a multiplicative subgroup, an algebraic subgroup, by a torsion point. And we think of these as sort of being special subvarieties. Uh, they have a certain additional structure that makes solutions of the type we're looking for more common. So now, if one is trying to, um, sorry for the airplane overhead, if one tries to generalize the setup to a higher dimension, something comes up which actually shows up in a whole bunch of special point problems. What you would like to say is that for a variety V inside C star to the N to have uh, infinitely many of these types of solutions, V has to be, has to have some sort of particular structure. It can't be random. The problem is that V can look random, but if it's higher dimensional, it can be, for example, a random surface that contains a special curve of some kind. And this is true whenever you're looking for any types of, of points on varieties. They may be rational points, they may be roots of unity, they may be special Poussin points. You always have to worry about sub-varieties which have special structure. And so even though in the n equals 2 case for curves, it was enough to ask about infinitely many points, in the general case, which was solved by Laurent, even though it was conjectured by Lang, um, it becomes a lot more natural to ask not about an infinite set of points, but about is a risky dense set of points, to ask whether all of the points inside V, whose coordinates are roots of unity, which we can think of as just torsion points in C star to the N, whether they're all contained inside some smaller subvariety. And the theorem is that um, if the answer is that there's a risky dense, then V has to be a torsion coset. And in fact, there's this more general statement that uh, Laurent proved, which is pretty much equivalent, that all, for any variety, all of the torsion points inside it lie in finitely many maximal torsion cosets, the finitely many things that, that uh, exist in V. And so this is a really kind of nice setup. Uh, one way to think about it is you have the Zariski structure, where you look at all closed subvarieties under the uh, partial uh, ordering given by containment. Inside that, you have the torsion sort of torsion setup, where you look at just the torsion cosets under containment. That's a much more rigid kind of structure. And one is sort of closed in the other. If you take infinitely many torsion things, and you look at the smallest is a risky thing which contains them all, then that already is a torsion thing. Okay, so this is sort of the simplest case. Sorry, my computer in before it dies. Um, this is sort of the simplest case of a special point problem um, from which a whole bunch of other conjectures flow. And so practically speaking, it serves as sort of a testing ground for approaches. Uh, I think by now there are at least 14 different solutions uh, to this particular theorem for different approaches, and one sort of takes them all and tries to see if they work in more general contexts. Okay, um, I would like to very briefly um, move to abelian varieties and the Manning Mumford conjecture, uh, because a similar story exists here. Um, once we make our definition with torsion cosets, it's, you don't even have to really stretch to understand what the conjecture is. You just make all the same definitions. Now there's not the relation to roots of unity, but if you replace your torus, you start at the end by an abelian variety, then abelian varieties have abelian subvarieties. They're their algebraic subgroups. And you can define torsion cosets in exactly the same way. And then you have this theorem um, proven by Renault, known as the Mann and Mumford conjecture that, uh, oh, sorry, there's a typo here. They should say V is inside A in an abelian variety, contains finitely many maximal torsion cosets. It's more difficult to, to prove, but the structure is exactly the same. So what I would like to focus on um, in this lecture is the Andre-Ort conjecture, 
which is a similar kind of setup in the uh, world of Shimura varieties. So before getting uh, very specific, let me just outline roughly um, what is happening here. So the, the setup is that one takes a Shimura variety. Now that's kind of a complicated object that requires a little bit of work to define. But for our purposes, it's enough to think of it as H mod gamma, where H is some Hermitian symmetric space, which you can think of as a generalized upper half plane. This, these aren't really scary objects. There's some classified list of them. Um, gamma is some discrete subgroup acting on H. And your Shimura variety will be the quotient of H by gamma. I will give some examples um, later on. But complex analytically, which is really what is most important for, for this problem, you can think about it in this kind of setup. And now, just like before, we had a special set of points, which were the torsion points. Um, S also contains a distinguished, arithmetically interesting uh, set of points, which one calls the special or the CM points. And it uh, uh, also contains a countable set of special subvarieties which aren't torsion cosets themselves, but these are certain distinguished subvarieties, which are, in a sense, themselves Shimura subvarieties embedded in sort of a Shimura way, just like our torsion cosets were themselves algebraic subgroups embedded in a way that respects the algebraic group structure. So you have this sort of self-symmetric uh, structure, just like before. And it was conjectured in general by Andre, now known as the Arud conjecture, in the exact same way that uh, an arbitrary subvariety of a Shimura variety contains finitely many of these maximal special subvarieties. And um, there's kind of a long history of this conjecture. Um, Andre had got the first unconditional result uh, in the case of the modular curve squared. Then there was a lot of work based on the idea of Eriksoven, eventually proven by Klingler, Ulmo, and Yafev. Um, affirming the conjecture under the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Um, and then um, a new sort of strategy came in by Pila, which is now known as the pila Zania strategy. Um, and this is what we're going to focus on um, today. I'm going to explain how this strategy works and um, <clears throat> what kind of mathematics goes into it. Okay. So. Sorry. Um, there we go. Okay, so let me uh, start by delving into the simplest case of the conjecture, which is the case of uh, y1 squared. So um, the underlying object here is y1, the modular curve, which you can think of in two different ways, uh, probably more than the different ways, but there's two very convenient ways to think about it. If you're used to sort of moduli spaces and algebraic geometry, you can think of it as the moduli space of elliptic curves. One has to be a little bit careful about stacky points and such, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, and if you prefer a sort of hands-on complex analytic description, you can think of Y1 as just the quotient of the upper half plane by SO to Z, where SO to Z acts in the usual way as fractional linear transformations. And so you have this kind of setup, which will be very important for us later, where you have this transcendental map pi between the upper half plane uh, and the modular curve, which essentially sends tau to the elliptic curve given by the quotient of C by uh, the lattice span by one and tau. And the fact that both H, the upper half plane and Y1 have algebraic structures is gonna be very important for us um, later on. Of course, the upper half plane is not itself an algebraic variety, but it's an open subset of the complex numbers which have an algebraic structure. So you, this has enough of an algebraic structure that it will still be interesting. And now the special point you can also think of um, in um, both of these worlds in very nice ways. So if you think of Y1 as the moduli space of elliptic curves, the special points are just those elliptic curves which have additional symmetries. And what does that mean? Well, one way to think about it is they have extra endomorphisms. Elliptic curves all have multiplication by integers. If you have anything else, um, you call that a special point. And if you think of it in this picture, 
um, then they are exactly uh, the, the, the points whose preimages are quadratic irrationals in the upper half plane. <clears throat> okay, so y1 itself is a curve, um, so it doesn't have any interesting special sub-varieties besides, uh, besides points. So to get interesting curves, interesting special sub-varieties, you have to move to y1 squared, to y1 cross y1. And now you can ask, what are the special curves in y1 squared? And they come in two, I guess, three families. Um, first of all, you have fibers over special points. So if you take x cross y1 or y1 cross x, where x is a special point as described here, then you get a special curve. And then you have these interesting Hegel correspondences, which people probably have seen before in one form or another, which in the language of moduli spaces, are just pairs of elliptic curves with a certain type of isogeny between them. <clears throat> so in this case, Tn is pairs of elliptic curves such that there exists a map between these curves and isogeny whose kernel is z mod n z. Okay, and so very concretely in this case, um, the theorem of Andre states that if you have a curve which contains infinitely many of these Cm points in y1 squared, so points, both of whose coordinates are CM, um, then that curve has to be special. And Andre's theorem is, is a very clever sort of use, both of transcendental number theory, the cusp in Y1, and the fact that you only have two variables, so they're, they're both dependent on each other. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very clever approach, but I don't think it works According to Andre, at least, I don't think it works in any other case besides uh, y1 squared. But it was the first unconditional result. And um, as I'll touch on later, all the, the proofs of this, um, of the Andrew Root conjecture, even in this case, go through some ineffective um, methods. Uh, and so uh, it was a big step when uh, there's been sort of a lot of work trying to effectivize some of this stuff. And in particular, uh, this theorem of Andre was proved effectively by Kune, Bilu, Masser, and Zanier in uh, 2000, well, 12 and 13. In particular, they have some, I think they, they looked at the specific curve J1 plus J2 equals one, and they can show that that has um, no solutions in, there, there is no CM points inside it. So the result isn't just effective, it's also practical to some extent. And there's currently being, done uh, some interesting work on doing the Andrew Root conjecture um, effectively. Okay, so um, the next example, which is sort of accounts for, I would say, half of all Shimura varieties, is AG, which is a very similar uh, story to the modular curve, but it's higher dimensional and therefore more, com more complicated, um, just to give you a, a sense of how these things look. So AG is the moduli space now of a billion varieties, G-dimensional, principally polarized abelian varieties. And it's also of the form, just like the modular curve was something modern discrete group action. Here it's the same story, but a little more complicated. You look at a symmetric matrices, X plus I, Y, and you take an open subset defined by, before we had Y is bigger than zero was a number. And now you insist that the imaginary part Y is positive definite as a quadratic form. That's what this y is bigger than zero here represents. And there's a certain action by the symplectic group, which is sort of a higher dimensional version of fractional linear transformations. You quotient out by that and you get, you get AG. Um, sorry, my file is lagging a little bit. Hopefully, okay, there. <clears throat> Um, and special points in AG are now also describable pretty explicitly. It gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so from the moduli sense, you just want, it's not enough to ask for more symmetries because you have room for a lot of symmetries now. You want to impose sufficiently many symmetries that you just get discrete points instead of positive dimensional things. And so what you have to do, it turns out, is you have to ask for a, a commutative algebra inside the endomorphism ring of maximal possible dimension. So in this case, you want the dimension over Q to be 2G. And um, 
the inverse image of these points inside uh, HG, known as Ziegel space, um, is, is not quite as simple as just all the points of a certain degree over Q, but it's some explicit subset inside them. So they still have a nice arithmetic interpretation up in Ziegel space that I don't want to describe explicitly. Um, okay, but then the special subvarieties in AG are now too numerous to enumerate explicitly, at least at this talk, but I think even in general, it's very hard to classify them all. It's easy to give examples, so you can look at uh, powers of the modular curve, which correspond to building an abelian variety by taking an elliptic curve to some big power, or you can look at a subset of abelian varieties with a specific endomorphism ring acting on them and get sort of a Hilbert modular variety. And then you can impose other endomorphism structures and do things like that. But there's a whole lot more stuff you can do. And it's hard to classify them all explicitly. It amounts to a problem that's roughly as difficult as understanding all semi-simple subgroups of the symplectic group. It's not exactly the same problem, but it's a similar feel. And you can see that it's, it's a little bit intangible. It's very hard to give a complete classification. But you don't sort of need to to work with this uh, to work with this structure. <clears throat> okay. So what I would like to do is um, I would like to shift gears a bit and um, introduce the Pilazani strategy for uh, proving these kind of special point problems. Um, and I want to introduce it in the simplest case of Lange's conjecture for n equals two. So already here you get a new proof, and let's remember what the setup is. The setup is we're looking at an algebraic curve in C star squared in the two-dimensional torus, which we're assuming has infinitely many torsion points, Wi on it. <clears throat> okay. So the first step is to notice that even though we're working over the complex numbers, supposedly, this problem has an inherently arithmetic flavor to it. All the torsion points are defined over Q bar, roots of unity are algebraic, integers. And so if this curve has any chance of containing infinitely many torsion points, it also has to be defined over Q bar. So over some, over some number field. And then what we're going to do is we're going to play off the fact that while roots of unity are very special in that they are algebraic and their log is algebraic once you normalize appropriately um, the log map itself is transcendental so you have this funny setup where we have this uniformization map pi from c squared to c star squared which essentially is coordinate wise exponentiation you throw in these two pi i's for arithmetic niceness reasons. And then you get this um, nice, this, this nice fact that this map pi is transcendental, but the roots of unity have uh, are algebraic and their inverse image is also algebraic. In fact, their inverse image is rational. Um, and that tension, playing off that tension, is a, an important component of the Pilazani strategy. So the way that works is as follows. You're essentially going to, going to get a contradiction by comparing a lower bound and an upper bound. And what these bounds are is you're trying to estimate the number of torsion points on, C, on, on Z. Now, Z has infinitely many torsion points by assumption. So what do you mean by the number? Well, to get a reasonable asymptotic, you have to find a way to sort of count these torsion points. And you do this very simply by looking at the order of a given point. So if Z has a bunch of these torsion points, you say, well, how sparse is this sequence? In principle, uh, when trying to solve this problem, you have to consider the worst case scenario, which is maybe you have one point of order a billion, then one point of order a trillion, and so on and so forth. So things could get arbitrarily bad. And it's sort of very hard. This is a practical observation. It's very hard to work with a sparse sequence like that. If you really have 
um, one point of a given order. And you have this true, this sort of fact for infinitely many orders, but a very sparse sequence, it's just very hard to get, to get anything going. So all the proofs of, of Lang's conjecture, or these special point problems, begin with a kind of observation where you say, look, if I have one point, I better have many points that are similar to this point. So how does that work? Well, it works in this case by considering the Gawa action. So let's say our curve Z is defined over Q instead of just some number field, just to make our life easier. And let's say it contains a, a torsion point, um, which I'll write as pi of A over N, B over N. So E to the power of two pi I A over N and E to the two pi I B over N. So this is some point of order N that's inside Z. Now, the nice thing about roots of unity is we know exactly how the Galois group acts on them. It just takes these A's and B's and it scales them. So you raise roots of unity to a certain power when you act on them with the Galois action and any power that's reasonable is allowed. So formally, if you have pi of A over N, B over N, then for all C's co-prime to N, you also have pi of C A over N and C B over N if you act by the Galois group action. And so that means that um, if you contain a single point of order n, sorry, this zero one is also a typo, I apologize, um, then in fact, you contain phi of n such points because you can just look at all different c's go prime to n. And phi of n is pretty big. So we're off to a good start for our lower bound. Now, where does our upper bound come from? Our upper bound, on the other hand, has to come from some sort of transcendence theory. So our curve Z is algebraic down in C star squared, but the map pi is extremely transcendental. <clears throat> so the way the proof works is you first show that if Z is not a very special kind of object, if it's not a torus coset, then its inverse image is transcendental. This is not a particularly difficult thing to prove. There's many elementary ways to do it in this case but it's the first hint of some sort of functional transcendence entering the story. Then once you prove that, you show that for a curve, an analytic curve to contain many rational points, it has to be algebraic. So a transcendental curve just can't contain that many rational points. In particular, you plug in this bound that I'll talk about a bit later, that if Z is transcendental, um, it contains at most n to the epsilon points um, of denominator n. And now you finish this by noticing that phi of n is quite big. It grows bigger than any power of n less than one. And that's so that lower bound and the upper bound um, aren't compatible. So again, to summarize, you look at how many torsion points of order n you contain. You use Galois theory to obtain a lower bound and then you use transcendence theory to obtain an upper bound and you show they don't, they don't mix. <clears throat> so in general, uh, even for a Shimura variety, though the strategy also works for abelian varieties, but for a Shimura variety, um, you can now try to play the same game. So we have this uniformization map from H to X, and we know that special points uh, behave arithmetically in a nice way, both on X and in their pre-image on H. And so you suppose you have some variety with a risky dense set of special points. Then what you do is you first of all use Galois theory to show that you contain many such points. And now if you take their inverse image in H, they actually become rational or almost rational. And then you argue that pi inverse of V, which is probably transcendental, can't contain many such rational points unless they come from algebraic varieties. And so now you're ripe to play a game of functional transcendence. Now you have something algebraic down in X whose inverse image in H has to contain algebraic things as well, even though this map pi is transcendental. Um, and now you are down to a transcendence question and you show that this can only happen if you already have um, something special going on, some, and uh, something of the type you want to show. 
So the three fundamental ingredients that go into the Pilazani strategy, and this is true not just for this problem, but for by now the many other problems to which the same strategy has been brought. For example, the recent work of um, Dimitrov, Gao, and Habeger on the uniform um, or Dow conjecture, in case of bounded ranks. Um, the three ingredients are the following. So first you need uh, to understand the behavior of rational points on transcendental sets. So you gotta show that if you have let's say an analytic variety that contains many rational points, then it has to be algebraic or it has to contain algebraic things. I'll make this more precise later on. But you gotta understand the behavior of rational points and transcendental sets. Secondly, you need functional transcendence results that are stronger than just showing this map pi is, algebra is transcendental. The map pi being transcendental is sort of the weakest possible transcendence result you could show. It's very much not the end of the story. Um, as we saw by just examining what we would need for this strategy to work, you have to show that not only is the spy transcendental, but there is in fact no algebraic, uh, no interaction between the algebraic structures upstairs and downstairs via this map pi. So at the very least, you want to understand the varieties that are algebraic in both worlds, in X, whose inverse image in H is algebraic. And then you also want to understand more than that. You want to understand when can you have an algebraic thing here whose inverse image here contains something algebraic. Questions like that. So you have to understand some functional transcendence. And then finally, the ingredient which in the case we just went through is easiest, but ends up being the hardest ingredient in the general case, you have to understand the Galois theory of what's going on. Because the Galois theory is the only method you have of saying that once you have a single point, you in fact have many points. Look at your Galois orbits. So you have to show that if you have a special point and you look at its Galois orbit, then that Galois orbit is big when you measure in some particular way compared to the complexity of X. In the setup we just went through, we defined the complexity to be the order of our torsion point. In general, you have to find some other way to measure the complexity of these points. But this is the fundamental strategy, um, and uh, basically um, all the effort in the past 10 years on this problem and similar problems um, rely on making these three ingredients work. Um, I can pause for, this might be a good time for questions if people uh, have some. If, if not, uh, I'll just continue. It sounds good. I'm especially interested in the large Gawa orbits part. <laughs> sounds good. Um, all right. So let me, I'll get to that part last, unfortunately. Uh, but let me start with the other two uh, briefly. Um, so let's first talk about um, rational points on transcendental sets. So this is the ingredient which was sort of um, known ahead of time, Pila had been working on this before he started working on these special point problems. So I'll go through it um, fairly quickly. So first of all, how do you count rational points? Well, a good way of counting them is by height. So if I give you a rational number, uh, it can have a big height if either its numerator or its denominator is complicated, it's big. You just take the max of those two, if it's the lowest common terms. There's a lot of number theory that goes into this function but uh, we're not going to focus on that. And then if you have um, a point in m-dimensional space, you just take its height to be the max of the height of the coordinates. This ends up being, what we're going to do is so robust, it doesn't really matter which function you take here. As long as you can sum them, you can take the max. As long as you do something reasonable, it's all the same. And then for any set S, um, you um, want to define a counting function of how many rational points does it have just by setting n of s comma x to be the number of rational points on s with height bounded by x. So this is just a sort of setup that allows you to count rational points on sets. Now this work starts um, with a the theorem of Bambieri Pila in 89, um, which resulted from answering a question of Peter Sarnak about whether low degree algebraic curves have the most algebraic point, uh, rational points they could possibly have. 
Um, and the theorem is the following, that if you look at irreducible, compact, real analytic, transcendental curves, so the first three words here are just to make it a nice set. You don't want some piano curve. Um, and the transcendental additive here just means your curve is not algebraic. So literally it means it doesn't satisfy uh, a polynomial relation in your variables. Then it doesn't have many, uh, many rational points. What does that mean? It means that if you count the number of rational points up to X, you get something sub polynomial growing slower than any power of X. I want to make two remarks. One is that um, if you're algebraic, that's no, just, that doesn't mean you have rational points all of a sudden. As we all know, most algebraic curves in some sense have finitely many rational points. So this theorem is saying that if you are to have any chance of having many rational points, you better be algebraic. Not that there's a dichotomy um, because most algebraic curves just don't have any either. The second thing I want to mention is that the total number of points to go around is polynomial in X. That's a simple counting estimate. <clears throat> so this is to be interpreted in the loosest possible sense. This O epsilon of X to the epsilon doesn't mean you don't have rational points and it doesn't mean those rational points aren't interesting. It just means that you can you sort of have not as many rational points as you could possibly have. You get some uh, important saving. On this sort of macroscopic picture, um, there aren't as many as possible. There still could be rational points. They could be very interesting. Okay. So that's the theorem for curves. Um, and I want to very briefly explain the idea behind this theorem. I'm not going to talk about the proof, but the idea goes back to a theorem of Yarnick, uh, to an idea of Yarnick in particular. So let's talk about a very simple case. Let's talk about circles in R squared, and let's try to estimate how many integer points circles have. Now, circles uh, don't have that many points, but let's show that if you have a radius L, then the number of points is bounded by L to the two thirds. And the idea is again an upper and lower bound. Um, so let's say you have three integer points which are close together. They're, excuse me, please. They're on an arc of length L theta, where theta you can imagine is some small number. Then what you do is you form the triangle between them and you ask how big is its area? Well, a triangle with integer coefficients has to have with integer coordinates has to have area at least one half. It's Beck's theorem. Uh, so that's your arithmetic lower bound. On the other hand, if your theta is small, your triangle is extremely obtuse. So if you just use the uh, formula for the area of a triangle, two sides times sine theta, you get a bound of L squared theta cubed. And so um, if theta is, there's also a typo, sorry, L to the minus two thirds you get most two points per arc, because this is a contradiction. And so you just break up into arcs of length L to the one third. You show that there's most two points per arc by this kind of argument, and that gives you your bound of L to the two thirds. <clears throat> so the idea of Ambieri Pila was, why don't we take this argument and uh, apply it in higher dimensions? Let's take our curve C, take some sort of Veronese embedding, and then consider volumes of sort of high dimensional simplices. If my curve is transcendental, those volumes won't be zero. And then if you compare an arithmetic lower bound and a geometric upper bound, you can get this result. <clears throat> That's a very nice idea and very nice theorem. Now to get something in higher dimensions, you have to be careful just like before about transcendental surfaces say, which contain algebraic curves and those curves could contain many rational points. So you have to find some way to insist that not just is your guy transcendental, but you have to watch out for sort of algebraic pockets inside it. And so this definition is very convenient. You take any set inside R to the M, you take its algebraic part to just be all the algebraic curves inside it. You just union them haphazardly. This will be some very, very large um, sort of messy fractal set. And you remove all that stuff to get the transcendental part. And the theorem by Pilla and Wilke, which I'm going to state in the compact real analytic case, though, of course, importantly, um, they generalized it to the O minimal framework, which becomes very important when you have cusps and things like that. I don't want to focus on that this talk, uh, that you get this x to the epsilon bound uh, as long as you remove all algebraic things. So one nice way of thinking about this theorem is if you have a set 
which contains no algebraic curves, then it has few rational points. Okay, and there are um, important generalizations of this due to them, where first of all, instead of counting rational points, you can count points of bounded degree, and second of all, as I already mentioned, instead of compact real analytic, you can say definable in an O minimal structure. And that's an important generalization, uh, but not one that I want to focus on. <clears throat> okay, so that's the story about counting uh, points on transcendental sets. Now, to motivate the functional transcendence part of the proof, let me start um, by just recalling what the classic transcendence theorems are. And let's just focus on the exponential function. So the theme of what's going on is that the exponential function is as transcendental as you can imagine, uh, except for the fact that it has this algebraic property. e to the x plus y is e to the x times e to the y. And so Shanuel made this very nice conjecture encapsulating this stuff in the um, complex number setup, where if you take n numbers, which have no q linear relations, and you take their exponentials, you get a total transcendence degree of at least n. Now, of course, normally you get 2n, because if you take n random numbers, there's no reason for any algebraic relations to hold here. And also, of course, you can guarantee n very easily just by making the first n algebraic, say, or their exponentials algebraic. This q linear independence is necessary exactly because of this relation, because if alpha 1 is additively dependent on the other alphas, then its exponential is multiplicatively dependent on them. And so neither alpha 1 nor either the alpha 1 is going to help out with our transcendence degree. This conjecture is very open. Uh, for example, if you just take n equals 2 and you plug in 1 and pi, you get that this, is, this implies that e and pi are algebraically independent, which itself is, is very open. It would be very interesting. Um, there's a bunch of um, partial results, and notably the lindemann warthrust theorem, saying this is true if the alpha i's are algebraic. One geometric way of thinking about this, which is nice because it motivates the functional analogs, is if you just look at the graph of the coordinate-wise exponential, what Shanyo's conjecture is telling you is that any complex point of this graph here has transcendence degree at least n. Just a straightforward rephrasing of, of this statement here. So now if you want to move to the functional setup, it suggests what you do. It says, suppose you have a transcendental map between two varieties, H and X. And let's say you have algebraic subvarieties inside them, VX and VH. And let's consider the graph of your, of your morphism. So this graph is... Um, lies inside the product of h and x, then, sorry, then it's important, as we already saw in the roots of unity setup, to single out certain subvarieties which behave nicely in both worlds. In particular, we're going to call something bialgebraic up in h if its image down in x is also algebraic. So in the case of the exponential functions, these are exactly affine linear subspaces in C to the n with rational slopes because their images in X are exactly cosets of tori. So you have these distinguished subvarieties um, which are algebraic in both worlds. And the conjecture is basically that, at least the x element conjecture, is that if anything funny happens in terms of these algebraic varieties interacting, it must factor through one of these bialgebraic things. It must be explained by one of these bialgebraic subvarieties. So concretely, if you have an algebraic variety upstairs whose image is contained in an algebraic variety downstairs, there's got to be something that's bialgebraic, S, which lives in both worlds, through which this fact, which explains this phenomenon. So which contains the smaller guy and is contained in the bigger guy. So that's known as the Axe-Lindemann that, that was coined uh, the x lindemann conjecture by Pila, and you can see, you can phrase it very generally. Whenever you have this kind of setup, you can make this kind of conjecture. This ends up being exactly what you need for the Andre Ewart conjecture, but it turns out you need even more 
if you want to do, for example, the work of Dimitri, Dimitri of Gao and Habegger, you want to study the Betty map, other applications of number theory, you need the strongest possible conjecture known as X Shanuel, which, uh, which says, essentially, let's look at the interaction of the algebraic structure on H and X with the graph of this map pi. So you can phrase it in an unlikely intersection way. If you take a subvariety in the product, then you say, let's look at its intersection with my graph. Now it's not gonna be empty. Dimension theory tells you, you can predict how big the dimension should be. And the theorem is that if the dimension of the intersection is larger than you would expect, which it, what you would expect is this, just count dimensions, then there has to be something bialgebraic, which, is, which explains this phenomenon. So the general gist of these conjectures is always that there is no algebraic information passed back and forth, except for what's passed through these bialgebraic guys. Okay. Now there's a long history of, uh, of work on this stuff. And once Pila made his work, uh, there was a resurgence of work on these problems. Um, so the uh, Axe Lindemann result ultimately was proved for all Shimura varieties by Klingler Omoyafaev, and Gaum generalized it to make Shimura varieties, and then Mach generalized in a slightly different direction. And then the Axe Shenuel result uh, has, by now, uh, there's, it, it sort of went through a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, there's recent work uh, of my student Kenneth Chu, uh, who's a grad student in Toronto, independently by Gao and Klingler, establishing this in the sort of, one might say, the most general setup of mixed hard structures, variations of mixed hard structures, which goes far beyond the, the Shimura variety setting. And there are sort of reasons one might care if one cares about doing things like uh, Shabuti results in higher dimensions. Okay, but so the functional transcendent stuff is, is well established at this point. Um, one thing I, I would like to mention, though I don't want to go into the proof, is these things interact in, in very surprising ways. So surprisingly to Pila himself, when he tried proving this, in the proof of the functional transcendence results, you end up using Pila Wilkie, the counting results for transcendental sets and O minimality again. They sort of enter the proof a second time uh, in a very different way than, than the first time. The first time was they entered the proof by looking at at sort of these special points and the pre-images and counting points like that. When trying to prove these functional transcendence results, you end up looking at the monodromy groups, which have an arithmetic structure, and you apply Pillowilki again to those groups. So it was this very funny setup where um, same ingredients show up over and over in unexpected ways. Can I ask um, Rachel and Andrew, am I supposed to finish at 2 or at 2.10? Well, usually at two, but um... that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> so let me say something about the last ingredient, which is um, how to establish these large GABA orbits. So the C star of the N case we already talked about. And uh, the kind of result you need is you just need a lower bound in terms of the order to some power. And it reduces to this very elementary statement that uh, phi of n is uh, big. It's, it, it grows at least like some power of n. Now, if one tries to understand the, <clears throat> so sorry, I don't know why this happened. Okay. If one tries to understand the abelian variety case, you end up needing a similar lower bound, but now it's much, it's much more complicated. You have to show that if you take a torsion point in a fixed abelian variety, and you look at its Galois orbit, then that orbit is large. It grows at least as quickly as um, the order of the torsion point to some power delta. There is by now a few different ways of proving this, but you can see already this has the, the sort of feel of like a Serre open image theorem. You want to look at the image of the Galois group inside the automorphisms of the Tate module. You want to show that's big enough to sort of make this work. Um, and it follows from work of Masser. There's also independent work of Winterberger, um, but you end up having to study that Galois representation. <clears throat> In the Shimura variety case, um, 
it sort of break the problem breaks up naturally into what happens for AG, uh, which reduces to studying certain types of special abelian varieties, and to the exceptional Shimura varieties, which we haven't really talked about yet, but they're the ones that don't correspond to moduli spaces of abelian varieties. What we need to show is the following. If you have an abelian variety, you have a special point corresponding to an abelian variety with complex multiplication. Let's say you're in a simple case, so the endomorphism ring is just some order in some field. What you end up having to show, this is far from obvious, but you have to go through and sort of see what the right notion of complexity is. What you end up having to show, this was formulated by Edixov as a conjecture, is that um, the Galois orbit of special points grows at least as quickly as a discriminant of your ring of endomorphisms to some power, depending on the on G. <clears throat> now, I want to point out that this is not, it's not even obvious that um, you have finitely many special points defined over Q. There's no, there's no sort of, yeah, the, even, the, even that's sort of not, not clear. So you need this sort of growth rate, and it's not clear there is a growth rate. So yeah, one corollary is that there are finitely many CM points defined over Q, which I believe wasn't known. Just, I don't know of a way to get this without doing some analytic number theory in this flavor. So I want to explain why sort of the obvious approach doesn't work in general. Um, you might think CM points are very nice um, uh, and class field theory and the theory of complex multiplication allows you to understand these Gala orbits in terms of sort of classical objects like class groups. So for G equals one, these Galois orbits are nothing but the class groups of quadratic fields, and this lower bound amounts to nothing more than the brouwer ziegel theorem in this context. In general, however, if you work out what happens in the higher G case, you don't get the size of a class group, but you get the size of the image of one class group in another through a natural reciprocity map. And the problem with, you can estimate both of these class groups but what ends up being difficult is that if you want to estimate the image, you have to worry about the kernel, of course. And the kernel could contain torsion pieces, so torsion subgroups um, of your class groups. Torsion in class groups is a very difficult problem. Uh, I really love this problem. It's one for which we know next to nothing. There are sort of the obvious brouwer ziegel bounds, and we expect a fixed torsion subgroup to be very, very small, but we can't prove almost anything. If we knew how to understand torsion and class groups, by which I mean like you fix n, you want the n torsion in the class group as the field varies. If we knew how to control that, then we could prove this directly using this method, but that seems to be a hard problem. And so that's why um, this approach, which works for g equals one and can be made to work up to g equals six, um, seems hard to carry out in general. Um, so how does the AG case work? I'm a little short on time, so let me um, go through it a little faster. The way it works is the following. The picture is that you have a whole bunch of CM points, which aren't in the same Galo orbit, but they're all very similar. They're all isogenous to each other. They all have the same fields of definition by the class group description, and they all have the same faultings height. And what you end up using is this principle that it's hard for an algebraic number to have a low degree, so a small Galo orbit, and small height, low complexity. And so if you want to show you have a large um, Galo orbit, you want to show that you have small height. And then that gives you a way to, to get that you have a large Galo orbit. So in this setting, how do you approach the faultings height of, of these abelian varieties? Um, it's, it's difficult. And so you just ask an algebraic number theorist to rewrite it in some other form. Um, and so in this case, there's the average Colmez formula, which now has two proofs, um, which tells you the faultings height of these C and B varieties is equal to some L function derivative discriminant thing. Um, it's something L functions are, are bread and butter in terms of estimating them. It's not at the center of the critical strip, it's at the border of the critical strip. Uh, that you end up having to show stuff. And so once you establish this formula, the average Colmez formula conjecture, you just go in, you get your upper bounds. That shows this faultings height is small. And then there was this, there's this trick you can play in AG. You can apply a theorem of Master and Wuzholz that say, 
if you have isogenous abelian varieties of low height and low Gawa degree, then there must be low degree isogenies between them. And so in this case, you get a contradiction by saying you have all of these different CM points. They're all, if they have low Gawa degree, low Gawa orbit, they have this low height already, then they must have low degree isogenies between them and there just aren't enough isogenies to go around. So that's one concrete way of, of, uh, of, of transferring this low height, low Gawa orbit phenomenon into a proof. Um, but the key is sort of estimating the faultings heights of these points. So what do you do um, in general? Well, for general Shimura varieties, they have no modular interpretation. So it's in fact, it's very hard to show anything about these guys. It's very hard to show that they're algebraic to begin with. That's the work of um, Bailey and Burrell. And then it's very hard to show their arithmetic to get the, the field down from C to Q bar. It's another challenge. That's Kajdan's theorem using a bunch of rigidity stuff. And then to get them down to an actual number field, like a reflex field, where you can show some complex multiplication stuff, is also a, a big step. That's sort of Milne's work on uh, Milne and a bunch of other people on canonical models. So the fact that you don't have model interpretations in general makes a lot of things, abs a lot of tools absent, in particular Master and Vusholtz have no result here. Um, but luckily recently, Benjamini uh, had, some, had a breakthrough uh, and then together with Schmidt and Yafayev, they found another way to approach this problem using transcendence theory again. What they do is they just look at the transcendental graph of this map pi that we talked about before. Now, CM points here give many algebraic points. And so you can try to play the pillow wilkie game. Now, the pillow wilkie game is not going to work. That's only about rational points, not about algebraic points of low degree. But Binyamini um, recently had a, a breakthrough on exactly this, where he greatly improved on pillow wilkie for certain special kinds of transcendental varieties, which these are. And his improvements included, first of all, the x to the epsilon, which we had, the t to the epsilon bound, he can replace by a polylog bound, which is much stronger. And more importantly, perhaps, his, his, his bounds um, don't require just counting rational points. He can count algebraic points, and he can get good bounds, bounds polynomial in the degree of the algebraic points. So the number field can really, can really vary. And using these improvements, um, you can get the reduction from low height to large Galo orbit in the general setup. So that's one key ingredient. The other key ingredient, uh, once you have this, is to go from the non abelian, from the abelian type setup, from the Shimura varieties parameterizing abelian varieties, to the non abelian type setup, to the ones that don't. And to do this, we end up using a uh, an old trick of the lead, which says that even though Shimura varieties themselves can be non-abelian, there's a sense in which all the CM points or the special points are abelian. So the special points all come from CM abelian varieties in some sort of complicated Shimura way in a, and in a different way for every special point. But once you realize this, you can hope to steal the height bounds you need from the um, AG case. And to do this, you need to define a sufficiently canonical and flexible theory of heights. Um, and so that's the majority of what happens in trying to get these Galois orbits up. First, you have this reduction by being a mini FF and Schmidt that says if you want large Galois orbits, it's enough to show a small faultings height. You have the small faultings height bound on AG using just an explicit formula, this average Colmes conjecture. And then you say that, well, my special points are all abelian type. So if I can define a general theory of heights, which is sufficiently compatible with Vey heights to make the point counting stuff work, and sufficiently compatible with the Shimura theory that I can steal the bounds from the abelian case, then I'll be in good shape. So I have, a, I have all these slides, which I didn't actually expect to get to ever. Um, which kind of detail how this happens. Also, my computer is being a little slow, um, but I'll just, I'll just show this slide, which is the idea is given the Shimura variety and an automorphic line bundle, you want to define a canonical height, which on the, on the one hand 
behaves like a V height. And on the other hand, it has good functoriality properties with respect to maps between Shibura varieties. And to do this part, um, you end up to construct this canonical height. You essentially make a height by doing it locally at every place. And that's where a lot of this recent work on Piatic Hodge theory, relative Piatic Hodge theory in families by Schultz and Yuan and Zhang and people uh, come into play. Um, so all this stuff happens. And thank you very much. I'll stop here. <laughs> thank you so much. This is a great time for questions. Um, uh, yeah, Niels? Hi, Jacob. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. It was very interesting. Uh, just uh, one, you, at some point you mentioned applications to Shabuti. Yeah. Do, do you have uh, something to, to add to that or to, to explain about that? Or? Sure, um, absolutely. So let me just boot that up in my brain. Um, yeah, so essentially if you, um, if you want to do the Shabuti uh, method, what you end up dealing with are these sort of non-algebraic, piatic, um, I forget what they're called, these, these unipotent sort of quotient uh, things. Um, and you have these higher Albanese maps to them. And what these are, uh, one way of interpreting these is their mixed period maps. Um, you have a mixed variation, it's a unipotent variation of mixed hard structures. And if you look at the corresponding uh, period map to the moduli space, that, that's uh, at least that reads off the kind of thing you're interested in. And so um, if you want to carry out the Shabuti strategy for either higher dimensional varieties or varieties over number fields larger than Q, because Shabuti is not field independent. So QP is the fundamental dimension one thing, um, you end up needing functional transcendence results. Uh, that's where this stuff comes from. And so one, uh, so you end up needing, in, in fact, these actual statements for mixed period maps. So one concrete case of this is, um, I believe Daniel Hast has a work which says that if the functional transcendent stuff can be proven in the mixed Hodge setup, which it now can, then he can make the Shabuti method work uh, for curves defined over arbitrary number fields. So that's one concrete statement. I think that's, a, that's on the archive as of 2019, I think. Uh, it might be published by now. But um, so that's already known. But in principle, you could try to make the Shabuti method work for arbitrary higher dimensional varieties now. It involves a lot of like concrete geometry, but now that the functional transcendent stuff is there, it's sort of a, all that stuff becomes within the realm of, of reason. Thanks. No worries. <clears throat> So I was wondering for these large Galois orbits, are you really using the full Galois group of Q bar over Q or is there some part of it that is especially um, um, meaningful? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let me think. No, I think you really are using the Galois group of Q bar over Q. So there's sort of, there's two parts to the argument. First you need, it's important that all the CM points behave the same way, because if they don't, then you might just have one point with a large Galois orbit, but that's not enough to get a contradiction. You sort of need to know that if one point goes bad, they all go bad. Uh, and that, so then it's important to know exactly how the Galois group of Q behaves. And then for these, um, after that, the, the bounds really come from saying that if you have a small fall things height, then you have a large Galois orbit. So secretly they're coming from these kind of Roth type methods where you construct large degree polynomials, uh, which vanish to a high order at a point and you compare upper and lower bounds. So it's that kind of technique that's coming into play rather than say, looking at the image of the Piatic Galois group or inertia subgroup and doing stuff like that. It's not, it's not really an algebraic number theory flavored argument. It's much more transcendental number theory that's going on. <clears throat> 